We're having a wonderful week at Bowling Green State University with Martin Norgard as our guest. Welcome. I do. So tell us a little bit about your musical background and your upbringing. I am born and raised in Denmark. I started play, uh, playing violin at the age of seven and um, was always kind of fooling around on the piano. So I started classically on the violin, but in my early teens started transferring some of the things that I knew on the piano to the violin. Got really interested in jazz, started listening to uh, Shawnee Ponte, who in the 60s were doing some or did some amazing jazz recording. Uh, my favorite recording is called Sunday Walk, it just got re-released, uh, so it's very easy now to find on Rhapsody and iTunes and Sunday Walk, check it out, it's Shawnee Ponte. And then realized that in order to really learn jazz, I would have to go to where the country that jazz was uh, born in. Well, that's when I went to um, Boston, first New England Conservatory, and then uh, William Patterson College, now it's university, and studied and got degrees in all in jazz performance. Were your parents musicians? Yes, my mother was a, a very, very accomplished clarinetist. And my dad was not, but my stepdad uh, was a violinist, uh, also a violin teacher for a while. He played some jazz on the guitar, also showed me. Stuff. So I wondered whether you went to concerts or were listening to recordings. How did you make that transfer to, to jazz from classical violin? I went to classical concerts as a kid. My mother always had chamber music. There is in Denmark a very, very famous jazz musician, probably the most famous jazz musician from the 30s and 40s in Denmark is a jazz violinist. Jazz on a violin in Denmark is not an unusual thing. His name is Sven Asmussen. His recordings are also available. He is like uh, Louis Armstrong in the United States. Very, very well known. So um, not such an unusual thing to play jazz on a violin in Denmark. When did you join a band? I know I was in a band in middle school and I played piano in that band initially. And then I played some violin in that band, I switched back and forth. I was in a garage band throughout my teenage years, I think. Tell us a little bit about your studies in the United States. I was incredibly fortunate uh, to end up at William Patterson uh, College, where uh, some of the top jazz musicians from uh, New York City would come out and teach. In my actual combo was Bill Stewart, who is now a very well-known drummer. Eric Alexander, a very well-known saxophone player. I learned as much from the people in my group, combo group, as I did from the, from the faculty. William Patterson College was, at the time, it was, I think still is, known for their jazz program in particular, and known for students just playing all the time. If you read about how the first generation jazz musicians learn, that's how they learn. You know, they would sit in and just play and play and play and play. And I think sometimes today we have kids in, in jazz theory classes that they learn the theory, but they don't have this oral experience of just sitting in and, and, and learning the music. So you've done quite a bit of publishing. Could you talk about some of the things and how that how that started? I was living in Nashville at the time. A friend of mine was writing for Mel Bay Publications. I uh, met Bill Bay, uh, Mel's son, and I asked him if he had a jazz violin instruction book, uh, and he didn't. He uh, asked me to write one. So my original book called Jazz Little Wizard is geared towards classical players that uh, want to learn to play jazz. I actually taught at Belmont University in Nashville for eight years or so, and in my teaching developed the book, so, so what I taught is became the book. So these were undergrads that had good technique, uh, some theory knowledge. The book is for advanced high school students and college students. Then later on, I uh, developed books for, for younger students, so uh, my Jazz Fiddle Wizard Junior books and Junior 2. So Jazz Fiddle Wizard Junior is geared towards 6th grade, 7th, 8th grade, and then the continuation Junior 2 has pieces in it. Both of the books have uh, both exercises and pieces that you can use in concerts. Second book, junior book, is upper middle school, high school. 
And then the last jazz book I wrote was, uh, is called Getting Into Gypsy Jazz, where I analyzed uh, lots of Stefan Grappelli solos and pulled out principles uh, that I then turned into exercises. So there are wonderful books out there with uh, Grappelli transcriptions where you can just read the solos, but I felt that there was a need for uh, exercises that really get people improvising. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your research, because I know that's a big part of your life. After teaching at Belmont, I returned to school and went to the University of Texas at Austin, got my PhD, and during that time got very interested in psych uh, psychology research. Now, uh, the research I do as faculty member at um, Georgia State University in Atlanta is all related to the cognition behind improvisation. In one study, we had uh, jazz pianists improvise in two conditions. In one condition they improvise normally, in another condition they are improvising while being tapped on their shoulders. And the idea is that artist level jazz musicians in concerts are able to divide their attention. Uh, they can both listen to other players and they can improvise at the same time. Uh, and how they would do that. So we came up with this experimental condition that mirrors that real life condition. And, and what's amazing is that all the jazz musicians, and of course we had artist level jazz musicians, were able to complete the task. They're playing these amazing solos while keeping count of taps on their shoulders. But what we found was that if in the conditions where they have an account, they use more patterns. The use of pre-learned melodic patterns seems to be a mechanism that helps artist level jazz musicians divide their attention so they can listen to other players or whatever else they have to do. Interestingly, in, in jazz history, sometimes you know, the use of patterns have been looked at as maybe being a, a negative thing, but I don't see it that way at all. I see patterns as a essential mechanisms that allows us to be creative, really. And I know that a lot of, in, in jazz pedagogy, um, we sometimes teach patterns and, and students play these figures in all 12 keys, and I think that's fine, but I think there's much more to, to it than that, because I think what happens is when we just listen to other solos, recordings, live, I think we pick up on melodic patterns without even knowing it, and that's one of the ways that we learn to play in that style. So this is your first time to Bowling Green State yeah. University, and, and you really had no expectations uh, no, from me, so what uh, do you think? It's great, but it's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very cold, yes. You know, I, I, I have, have so far a wonderful time, and the student was just amazing. I mean, we just had one of your grad students that was just able to pick up stuff faster than I could throw it at him. It was well, certainly fun. faster than <laughs> I could have processed. So. So I'm looking forward to the next couple of days. Well, we are glad to have you. Thanks so much for coming. It's my pleasure.